Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Well, good morning. Happy Easter. Good to see all y'all here at the, what is there? are we not, we're at the 10, 10 o'clock now? It's been kind of a blur this morning. We've had four services. Uh, it is such an honor to be able to get to share this morning. Pastor Marcus, one of my dearest friends in the whole world, I love that guy. I had dinner with him last night and I was like, man, I'm so thankful that God brought this guy into my life. He gave me the privilege this morning of getting to share. Uh, maybe it's because there were four services, but uh, <laughs> he gave me the privilege of getting to share on Easter. So it, I'm super excited to be with you guys as we continue. My name is Joel, by the way. Uh, I'm the teaching guy here. And as we continue our series called Name Dropper. Now, a name dropper, if you don't have one of those in your life, they're one of these people that uses somebody else's name to get access to something they wouldn't be able to get otherwise. So they say, hey, I, I know so-and-so over here. And they're like, oh, oh, really? Okay, well, if you're a friend of his, I guess we'll let you in over here. And the beautiful thing about God is he says, hey, you know what? If you call on my name, you'll be saved. And God has so many wonderful things about who he is. He's so big. There are so many names for him in the scripture that there are so many attributes of him, aspects of him, that there's so many names. We talked about Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, our banner. Last week, we talked about Jehovah Shalom. God is our peace. Any challenge you face in this life, God is the answer. The answer, the answer to every prayer is God himself. So we've been looking at the different aspects of God. And today, I want to look at one that you've probably, it's unlikely you've ever heard of it because it's not a really common name that they call him. Um, and it doesn't really rhyme very well, so they don't put it in songs. You know, like we have songs like Jaira and stuff like that. This one that we're going to talk about today is called Jehovah Sid Kenu. Sid Kenu. It's like Sid in a canoe. Jehovah Sid Kenu. And it, it means God our righteousness. So we're going to talk about this morning what that means to us. Now, I've been uh, hanging out in the church for about 45 years now, 46 years. And I've been serving in ministry. My dad was a pastor. And I've pretty much heard every question you can get. But every once in a while, somebody comes up and asks me a question that kind of throws me off. I'm like, huh, what, what does that mean? I'll never forget, a couple years ago, I'd just gotten done speaking, and a guy came down the, the aisle here, and he asked me this. He said, is it okay to celebrate Christmas? I thought, uh, yeah, like this Jesus' birth and stuff. Like, yeah, it's okay to celebrate Christmas. And he kind of looked at me, and, I, and I, here's one thing I've learned, and this is a pro tip for you if you're in a relationship with anybody, kids, parents. If somebody asks you a weird question, and you're going, what in the world does that mean? The question is not the question. The question is actually another question. So you need to dig a little deeper. If your spouse asks you a question, you're like, well, that's a weird question. Trust me, the question wasn't the the question. They were actually asking that question, maybe because they didn't know what they were actually asking or because they were trying to figure out where you stood on something. And they're like, let's take a side door here. So I said, what are you really asking me, man? And he said this. He said, man, when I was on drugs and addicted, I messed things up so bad. And now that I'm clean, I just want to do it right. I just want to get it right. He said, I just see Christmas, and we used to celebrate Christmas. It was a big party, and we're giving gifts and stuff. He said, I just wonder, is it okay to celebrate Christmas? I said, yeah, it's fine to celebrate Christmas, because really what's behind it is the heart behind it. But it got me thinking, because I thought that was a great thing that he said. He said this. He said, I just, I just want to get this right. And I know if every one of us in this room, if we were to talk for a few minutes, I know that every one of you, in, 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 there's an area in your life where you'd say, I just want to get it right. For some of you, man, you just became parents. You're a father, and you're looking, you're going, I did not have a good father example, and I want to make sure I get this right, and I can be the father to my kids that my father never was to me. I want to get this right. Maybe you're a mother, and you're going, man, this kid is just, this is overwhelming, and I didn't have a good example, and I mean, is it supposed to be this hard? And like, I didn't know raising kids was going to be this hard, but I just want to get this right. Some men out there, you felt the weight of growing up poor and all of your friends got the Jordans and you didn't get the Air Jordans and you felt the weight of not having the stuff all of your other friends had and it was embarrassing and you go, you vowed, I'm never, I'm gonna make sure my kids never have to experience that poverty. So you're working so hard and you're trying to give your kids everything you got. You're going, I just wanna get this right. But you're also seeing and you're going, but am I spoiling them? And you're trying to figure out where's the line between that? Some of you, You're saying, man, with marriage, I just want to get this right because the last one didn't go very well. And I know I made some mistakes, but I want to make sure this marriage, I want to make sure I get this right. I talked to a guy last week. He rolled up here in a wheelchair. I I recognized his face, but he looked like literally half the man he used to be. 
And he was smiling though. And I said, wow, what's up? And he said, man, I just got out of eight weeks of chemotherapy. He said, it nearly killed me. And I'm like, well, it doesn't sound like it. You're like glowing. And he said, yeah. He said, when I went into this, I just knew I had to get this right. Because I believed God had something for me on the other side if I could keep my attitude right in the middle of this. And man, his story was probably one of the most inspiring things I've heard. He made me cry, man. It was the most inspiring things I've heard in weeks. But he said, I just knew going into this struggle that I had to get this right because God was putting a test before me. And I said, you know, I don't believe God sends cancer to you as a test, but I do believe that the bad things that happen in this life, he will help you overcome them. He'll walk through them with you. And on the other side, it ultimately shows it is a test proving you've, you're stronger than you think you are with God's power working within you. Amen. We've all got an area in our life where we go, man, I just want to get it right. And you know, that's a good sign. As a mental health counselor, I'll tell you this. Healthy people want to do things right. And I'll give you an example of, of something that's not healthy. You know, when, you, when you're addicted, you're an addict, you don't want to get things right. You just want your next fix. And you'll do whatever it takes. You'll lie, you'll steal, you'll rob people just to get what you want. You're not worried about making things right. You just want your needs met. People that are at the bot rock bottom, they're trying to get their needs met. They'll do anything to just stop the pain. I don't, I don't care about doing it right. I'll do whatever it takes to stop the pain. But when you get to a level that you're a little bit healthy, mentally, emotionally, you want to make things right. And that's a good sign. But here's what else I know about you. If you're like me, I have a very hard time making things right. As hard as I try, I, I, I just tend to mess things up. And I don't always know if I'm getting things right, but I sure know when I'm getting things wrong. My wife tells me. <laughs> or my daughter this week told me. She said, Dad, the way you spoke to me was very harsh and it hurt my feelings. This is an eight-year-old. And I was like, oh. And I realized, you know what? That was like, I was too over the top and I, was, I just exploded at her. And that's the thing, like I want to do what's right, but sometimes just out of nowhere, I just lose it. And I'm like, oh, this kid just, ah. And then afterwards I feel all guilty and I'm like, oh my gosh. And I know you, some of you guys are the same way. So when you explode in anger, you're like, where did that come from? That's like, I don't want to be this way. I love this family, but I just explode in anger. And then afterwards you feel all guilty and like, man, am I losing my salvation? Like what's happening here? And we all want to get it right, but we end up getting it wrong. In fact, I think one of the most relatable passages in the Bible is something Paul said. I know you can relate to this. Paul says this. This is Paul. Now, this is the encouraging thing. Paul, the dude, wrote half of the New Testament, and he said this. He said, I don't understand what I do. For, I, for what I want to do, I don't do. Like, I have these great lofty ambitions. Every January 1st, I'm like, all right, we're going to get it right this year. We're going to get the health under control. We're going to get everything fixed. And then by February, you're like, oh, I messed it up again. He says, I don't understand what I do. But what I hate, that's actually what I do. I hate it when I get angry. I hate it when I lie and I didn't need to lie. But I, I just did it out of this defense mechanism or response. And I hate it. And I end up doing these things. I want to get it right over here, but I just keep doing the things I hate. And he says, and if I do what I don't want to do, I agree that the law is good. Now, what he's saying here is basically what I just said a second ago, this idea that healthy people want to get it right. The law says, here's the standard. And it's kind of hovering up here. And the law needs to be perfect. Like we need there to be a perfect standard. But all of us go and we go, man, I, I just can't quite reach it. Every time I try and reach up there, he's saying the law is perfect and you can't get there. And the fact that you can't do what's right shows that the law is perfect because you're not perfect. And he says this, as it is, it's no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. You notice he didn't say the devil made me do it? The devil made me do it. No, he's saying, look, sin is living in me. Now you go, well, what does that mean? Here's, here's what he means by that. Salvation is an ongoing process. The first step in salvation is what's called justification. Justification is recognizing you have sinned. You fall short of the glory of God. You can't get it right even on your best day. And what, what we do is we call out to God and we say, God, I can't get it right. And he said, that's cool because my son Jesus did it right. So if you'll take on his identity and, and take his forgiveness, when I see you, it's justified. It's just as if I'd never sinned. When God looks at you, if you've accepted the gift of Christ, all he sees is perfection. That's that verse that says, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. What that means is if you're in Christ, you've asked forgiveness of your sins, but you're feeling condemned and condemnation, that's not from God. 
Because God poured out all of his condemnation on his son, Jesus, and you don't have to carry that anymore. And then the next process is once you're justified, he says, now you're saved, your spirit is transformed, but now I want to get your thoughts, your emotions, your actions in line with what's already going on inside of you. He says, I want you now to become who you already are. And that's the process of a lifetime. It's called the process we call sanctification. This is what Paul's saying. He's like, this law is up here and I can't live up to it. And and the worst part is, here's the really hard part. I have some really good days, y'all, where I I get it right. But I also, I can really mess things up even on my good days. I have good intentions. A couple weeks ago, I was talking to some friends of mine. They were really discouraged. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna encourage them. And I called them. We got on the phone and she was just talking about how hard things were and how overwhelmed she was. And I said to her, I said, listen, I said, look, you just don't have the bandwidth right now to pull this off. Like you just, there's not enough time. There's not enough energy. So just go easy on yourself and just, it's going to be okay. And they both got real quiet and they said, okay, we got to go. I'm like, okay. Well, they hung up the phone. A few hours later, the husband calls me back. He's like, bro, my wife has been crying nonstop since you got off the phone. I said, what? wait, what? Is it because I was so encouraging? He's like, no, because you told her she didn't have enough bandwidth. And I was like, No, that was supposed to make her life easier. She doesn't have bandwidth. Like she didn't have the space right now to do it and that's okay. And he goes, well, what she heard is you're not good enough. And I was like, oh, that's not what I meant. And how many of us in our lives, we're trying to make things right. Maybe you're trying to make things right in the marriage, but every time you step out and you're like, all right, I'm gonna say this thing. And they they take in the completely wrong way and you make a bigger mess than you had before. This is the battle we face. Even in our goodness, we can't get it right. That's what in Isaiah, it says this. It says, all of us, we've become like one who's unclean and all our righteous acts, they're like filthy rags. I've got this old truck. It's an old beat up truck and uh, the, the defrost doesn't work on it. And I could get it fixed, but it's like $1,000 to get it fixed. There's an actuator that doesn't work. So the challenge I have is this time of year, when I get out to the truck, there's all this fog in the window and I try and get it cleaned, right? But the defrost doesn't work. So what I did... Uh, this week is, I had to go somewhere really quick, so I just grabbed the first thing that was available, and it was a glove in the uh, front of the front of my uh, truck, and I got it, and I started cleaning the window off, but I had forgotten, I had just used that glove to fix a plumbing issue, and there was plumbing cement all over the glove, and I just smeared it all over the window, and I made this humongous mess of things, and I thought, man, that's a good picture of our life, isn't it? All of our righteousness, it's like a filthy rag. And we're trying to clean up a mess and we're just making a bigger and bigger and bigger mess of it. And this is where the good news of Jesus comes in. Jesus says, guys, I know you want to do what's right, but you're not going to be able to pull it off. You can't do it on your own. This is where Paul, uh, this is where in Jeremiah, when they're prophesying Jesus and what he's going to be for us. It says, in his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called. They're talking about Jesus coming. The Lord, our righteous Savior. That word is Jehovah Sidkenu. The Lord, our righteousness. Righteousness is simply means this, getting it right. The ability to get it right. And the beautiful thing that we're celebrating right now because of Jesus' gift is this. Jesus got it right. And he gives us the power to do the same. Jesus came, he lived the perfect life, he got it right, and he says, now because you can't do it, I'm going to do for you what you can't do for yourself. And this is where Paul says this, he says, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. It's like God says, hey, look, you're a, you're a dirty rag there, right? So I'm going to clean this, it's like you're this glove, and he says, I'm going to clean this thing up really good, and he cleans it up. And there's no more stain, no more taint on it. It's perfectly clear. And this is the beautiful thing. He says, all this comes from God, who through Christ reconciled. That means he restored the relationship between God and man. Reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses, their sins against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. It's like this. He says, not only have I cleaned you, but you've been trying to do it right. Some of you have been saved for a long time. You accepted Christ a long time ago, and you've been trying to do it right, man. You've been white-knuckling it, and your answer to everything is just, I need more discipline. That's my answer to everything. Things are struggling in the family. I'm like, this family just needs more discipline. Just 
do what I say. And it doesn't go well because none of us can keep the discipline. And I realize every day I go, man, I just cannot, I don't have enough energy to get this right all of the time. And the beautiful thing this verse is saying, he says, not only does he clean you up, he says, hey, let me come and live my life through you, my strong, mighty right hand, and give you the power to do what you couldn't do on your own. This is us without him. And he says, no, let me come and I'm going to live my life through you. I'm going to be your righteousness. Not only am I going to forgive you of your sins, I'm going to give you the power you need to live out this faith. Because you can't do it on your own. Because you still get angry. You still get frustrated. You still get depressed and discouraged. And you think something's wrong with you. Well, the bottom line is you need to stop and you say, God, I can't do this on my own. I need you to live your life and empower me. And this is where Paul goes on and says this. He says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. God's not mad at you because of Jesus' gift. He's not mad at you anymore if you accept that gift. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Jesus, he turned him to sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. A few years ago, I went to visit a friend of mine who lives in Israel and he works for the U.S. Embassy there. And I was going to rent a car and he said, why are you going to rent a car? Just use mine. I was like, oh, I can just drive your car. He's like, yeah, and it's got diplomatic plates on it. I said, what, what are diplomatic plates? He said, well, when police see that plate, they know not to mess with you. That license plate says you're a diplomat from the U.S. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? He goes, when you're in that car, they have no jurisdiction over you. You're in the United States of America when you're in that car. You have the backing of the United States government when you're in that car. They can't mess with you. And I go, ha. So I can do whatever I want? And he goes, no, do not do whatever you want. He said, you're a representative of the U.S. government. He said, you're representing the United States. So you, walk, you, you drive in this car with this authority, but with that authority, the goal is you walk, you, you live right and you do what's right. And that's the difference in our faith. We don't do, we, we live out our faith because, man, we have the authority of Christ and it's, we get to walk out that authority. When, when they see us, they see us, they see the righteousness of Christ. And they see that forgiveness. And that's what he's saying. Now your job, you've been forgiven. And your job now is to walk in that power that he's given you. You've got the backing of the most powerful force in the universe. God himself is behind you. And he's saying, look, I know you can't pull it off on your own. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to do for you what you can't do for yourself. Because I did it right. So you're saying, man, the marriage, every time I try and fix it, it just goes south. And God's saying, hey, come and let me live my life through your words, your actions, the things you do. Listen to the Holy Spirit and see what he says. In your finances, you're saying, man, I just can't get ahead. I want to be generous, but I can't. He's saying, look, let me live through you. And you stop trying to do it on your own. Stop trying to do all this thing on your own with your own power because you just don't have the bandwidth. You don't have the energy. Whatever it is in your life right now that you're struggling with trying to deal with, listen, God is the answer. The answer to every prayer you have is God himself. And if you've been trying to do it on your, your own, trying to get it right on your own, you know that this, you're not going to get it right on your own. The Lord Jesus is your righteousness. Not only is he your righteousness in your stance before God, your forgiveness before God, he's also the power you need to overcome whatever it is you're facing this morning. And listen, when that power gets involved, nothing is impossible. He can do things through you that you go, I, I, it wasn't me. It was Christ in me. There's no way I could have pulled this off. This, this, I've seen guys, I've seen relationships restored that were impossible. There's no way that could have ever been restored. I've seen them restored and even better than ever. I've seen people in financial straits, dire straits. Man, now they're some of the most generous people I know. That can be the story for you. But it all comes through Christ empowering you and living his life through you. You guys receive that? Yeah. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that your resurrection from the dead shows that nothing is impossible. You are the most powerful force in the universe. And not only did you forgive our sins, you give us the power to walk this thing out, to get it right in this life, to walk according to your principles, Lord. And I thank you that you give us that power. If you're here this morning and you do not have that relationship right with Jesus, you have not accepted the gift of forgiveness that Jesus offers. He paid the price for your sin. He did for you what you couldn't do on your own. I'm gonna say a prayer in just a second. And if you say this prayer and you mean it in your, all your heart, God is gonna come. He's gonna forgive your sins. He's going to transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness and he's going to set you up with an eternal address and eternity with him. It all starts when you say this prayer. Let's say this prayer all together. Lord Jesus, 
We repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. March 31st, Easter Sunday, 2024 is a new day for you. We've got some resources for you in the back there. If you just said that prayer under the do it again sign, man, you guys be blessed. Walk in the power that God gives you. You can give Easter offering on the way out. You are dismissed. Be blessed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.